This is the third and last video in this brief series on pacemakers. Let's start with implantable cardioverter defibrillators, or ICDs. These devices are used to terminate VT and VF in high-risk patients. They have both typical pacing and sensing electrodes, and one to two defibrillation electrodes composed of coils of wire. The metal housing of the generator itself can serve as a third electrode. Indications for an ICD include secondary prevention following cardiac arrest or sustained VT in the absence of a completely reversible cause, and the primary prevention of sudden cardiac death in patients who have New York Heart Association Class 2 or 3 heart failure and an EF of 35% or less, are post-MI and have an EF of 30% or less, or are high-risk patients with congenital long QT syndrome, channelopathies such as Brugada, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. For those who are having the ICD placed due to heart failure or being post-MI with low EF, they must be re-evaluated after three months of optimal medical therapy before implantation. In addition to defibrillation, ICDs also have an anti-tachycardia pacing, or ATP, function, which will attempt to stop a reentrant VT by briefly pacing the ventricles at a rate faster than the VT before switching to defibrillation. ATP is usually delivered in bursts of about eight pacing impulses with at least two attempts by the device prior to shock. Here's an example of what that might look like. On the left are five beats of VT at a rate of 136 beats per minute. That is, the QRS complexes are separated by 440 milliseconds. Then there are eight paced beats at a rate of 176 beats per minute or at intervals of 340 milliseconds. And once the pre-specified pacing burst is finished, there's a very brief pause, and the patient is back in sinus rhythm. Once again, if this is not successful, the defibrillator will switch to shocking the patient. Here's what a single lead ICD looks like on chest x-ray. Here's the generator, which is a little larger than a typical pacemaker, as it also needs to include a capacitor to store the shock charge. And then along the course of the ventricular lead, you can see two stretches where the lead looks much thicker. These are the shock coils. The upper one sits in the superior vena cava and the lower one in the right ventricle. With ICDs that have only one shock coil, it's the RV coil that's placed and the SVC coil that's omitted. There are different possible configurations for the defibrillation current, but the most common is for the RV coil to serve as one pole, with the SVC coil and generator together serving as the other. Moving on to biventricular pacing, symptomatic ventricular dyssynchrony can occur from either RV pacing and or from an underlying cardiomyopathy, particularly when a bundle branch block or other form of intraventricular conduction delay is present. In this case, the insertion of an additional lead going to the left ventricle can restore synchrony and lead to an improvement in cardiac output. The lead reaches the left ventricle by being fed from the right atrium through the coronary sinus and around the posterior side of the heart. This is known as cardiac resynchronization therapy, or CRT, and it is solely done in patients with systolic heart failure. Referral for CRT is complicated but is primarily based on four parameters, the left ventricular EF, the QRS width, the QRS morphology, and the patient's New York Heart Association functional class. Here is a biventricular ICD, usually abbreviated BIV ICD. The left ventricular lead located within the coronary sinus is right here. I'll end the video discussing the interaction between the, these devices and magnets and MRI scanners. Placing a strong magnet directly over a conventional pacemaker will switch its mode to asynchronous. So AAI becomes AOO, VVI becomes VOO, and DDD becomes DOO. In clinical practice, the need for this action is usually limited to the emergency room and the OR, and very rarely the CCU. So in those locations, you will often find sufficiently strong magnets placed somewhere very obvious, like stuck to the outside of the crash cart or on a filing cabinet. They are usually donut shaped and light blue in color to make them distinctive in appearance and thus easy to find. Depending on the situation, you may even see a patient with the magnet taped to their chest wall 
since as soon as the external magnetic field is removed, the device will revert to its previous mode. Indications for placing a magnet over the chest include very brief use during electrocautery and for the termination of pacemaker-mediated tachycardia. Notably, however, placing the same magnet directly over an ICD will not switch its mode, but will instead turn off the defibrillation and anti-tachycardia pacing functions. Indications for this include electrocautery again, repeated inappropriate shocks, or to prevent a shock from being delivered to a patient on comfort care. But use of the magnets in these last two indications should be followed by a STAT EP consult for either adjusting the defibrillation settings or permanently turning it off. There has been long-standing concern regarding the safety of MRI scanners in patients with pacemakers and ICDs. After all, MRI scanners contain extremely powerful magnets, and magnets can induce electric currents. So you can imagine one of the concerns is that the MRI scanner will have direct electrical effects from induced current within the leads. This can lead to inappropriate inhibition or triggering of the device, such as oversensing leading to a failure to pace, the triggering of tachyarrhythmias, and potentially even inappropriate ICD shocks. But these are not the only concern. There's also the possibility that the induced electric currents will heat the leads, leading to tissue and or device damage. There's also the theoretical possibility of pacing being inhibited during the scan due to something called the magnetohydrodynamic effect, which can create a voltage across the lumen of the descending aorta due to ions in blood moving through a strong magnetic field. These voltages could be misinterpreted by the pacemaker as intrinsic cardiac electrical activity inhibiting pacing. This is only a risk in extremely powerful magnetic fields that are oriented in a specific direction. It will not happen with the kind of magnet a person could encounter in everyday life. The majority of older pacemakers and ICDs are MRI unsafe, meaning that most hospitals consider MRIs in patients with such devices to be absolutely contraindicated. However, the risk of harm is much lower than previously thought if special precautions are taken and the patient meets other criteria. Thus, a small number of hospitals have developed protocols that allow for MRIs in patients with devices that are usually not considered MRI compatible. Almost all pacemakers and ICDs that are being placed today are labeled MR conditional, which is commonly assumed to mean they are MRI compatible or MRI safe, though the device companies don't like that terminology because there is still a very small but non-zero risk of the aforementioned complications. That's it for this three video overview of pacemakers. I hope you found these videos to be helpful. If you're interested in learning even more about this topic, there will be a forthcoming video on pacemakers in my series on EKGs.